Welcome back to another session in Corpus Linguistics. Today we're going to focus on corpora of speech, a fairly recent development in Corpus Linguistics. We'll pay particular attention to those linguistic features that seem disproportionately frequent in speech, and we'll ask what they are doing. How do they manage relations between a speaker and a listener? So, to preview this session, we'll look at what have been called discourse markers in spoken corpora. We'll think about their role in the mutual construction of conversation, and we'll think about the linguistic nature of being a listener, or a listenership, as it's been called. Effectively, we're thinking about how conversational language manages relationships between participants in interaction. Many of the ideas and the examples in this session come from Anne O'Keefe, Mike McCarthy and Ron Carter's book, From Corpus to Classroom, published by Cambridge University Press. We begin with discourse markers. What are they? Well, they're interesting little linguistic features that are easy to neglect because we use them a lot, but they seem, well, empty of meaning. They are items like, okay, right, yeah, well, so, anyway, you know, and so on. There are also longer formulaic items like, you know what I mean, and at the end of the day. What makes these features eligible to be considered as a separate class, something we would call discourse markers? Well, one clue is in the distribution of these features. Corpus evidence shows that these expressions occur much more frequently in speech than in writing. If you look at the results of a chart search on COCA for right or at the end of the day, then you can quickly see that while the features are certainly present in written genres, they are much, much more frequent in spoken discourse. The disproportionate presence of these features in speech strongly suggests that they have a particular function in speech that they don't necessarily have in writing. And so their function in speech merits a closer look. So what do we find when we look at these items more closely in speech? Well, we find that they very often occur in responses to what someone else is saying. Response tokens by listeners have been given various names in the linguistics literature. Back channeling, minimal and non-minimal responses, and sometimes listener response. Minimal responses are usually short utterances, often one or two syllables in length, like yeah, okay, mm-hmm. Response tokens might indeed be non-verbal, consisting of a nod, a shrug, or a flash of the eyebrows. Depending on your corpus, such features may or may not be coded and tagged. Non-minimal responses are more substantial. They may be adverbs like totally, or adjectives like right, or longer phrases like is that so, or is that right. We can see how these tokens work by looking in detail at transcripts from spoken corpora. This one is from the Scots corpus. Speaker M642 is the main contributor at this point in the conversation. He's telling a story about a mo motorbike champion. The listeners respond minimally with tokens like uh huh, ha, huh, I, and a non-verbal response, a laugh. Here we see non-minimal response tokens in a different conversation, this time between two students talking about their dissertation or thesis topics. And the non-minimal responses include right and oh right. Sometimes these response tokens are grouped or clustered by speakers. Here in this conversation, again from the Scots corpus, we see three minimal response tokens in sequence. Uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm. It's not always easy to know what to make of these features. Carter and McCarthy have suggested that clustering occurs at the boundaries of topics, but from the Scots evidence that I've looked at, this claim is difficult to support. But we can at least use corpora to identify response tokens and to find out which ones are most common in speech. McCarthy and Carter again list the 20 most common non-minimal response tokens in English. These are expressions that learners are likely to encounter very frequently in conversation. Can they also use them productively in speech? And can they use them appropriately? 
To teach response tokens effectively, we do need to examine what they do. Discourse analysts suggest that they have four main functions. First, to indicate to the speaker that he or she can carry on. The speaker is talking and the, and the listener simply says mm-hmm or similar to indicate that they're listening. Secondly, the listener might indicate agreement with the speaker. The tokens used to accomplish this are called convergence tokens and they include expressions like yeah, I know, sure, totally, or you simply repeat what the speaker has just said. Thirdly, there are engagement tokens that express enthusiasm or empathy or surprise or shock at what the speaker is saying. Expressions like aw, oh, no, you're kidding, and so on. And finally, there are response tokens that are specific to particular contexts. For example, you might acknowledge an arrangement like making a date to see someone with a token like fine with me, or you might agree to a service request by saying certainly sir, or right away madam, and so on. We can look these response tokens up using, for example, the advanced search function of the Scots corpus. We would type aha uh -huh into the word search box and set the document details to spoken. This will give you a concordance of minimal response tokens and you can check their function. Is the speaker inviting continuation or expressing convergence, for example? Again, we can return if we want to the transcripts themselves to see the expression in context. One common convergence token is totally, which often occurs by itself in an utterance, as we can see from this example from the Scots corpus. Engagement tokens include laughter and sympathetic noises like aw, and they are very, very frequent in conversation, as we can see from this example from the Scots corpus. So, to sum up so far, we can ask ourselves, is an expression unusually frequent in spoken discourse compared to written genres? If so, the chances are it has a function as a discourse marker of some kind. Qualitative analysis of concordance lines is particularly useful in establishing the pragmatic function of these expressions. Response tokens are involved in what might be called active listenership. Other functions of discourse markers have been identified. For example, organizing the structure of a discourse by signaling its opening or closing. Sequencing information. Marking topic boundaries and shifts in topic or returns to a topic. And focusing attention. Another set of discourse markers is used to monitor the discourse by reformulating things that have not been understood or made clear, or indicating shared ground or shared knowledge. A productive research area is the investigation of stance, or how do discourse markers signal how you feel about something? Actually, indicates that you feel that something is a fact. I must say, indicates your commitment to a particular point of view. I'm afraid acknowledges that the speaker is going to diverge from the listener's position, and so on. In speech, speakers tend to avoid too much precision and hedge or soften their claims using expressions like kind of, sort of. These discourse markers help us to manage our relationships that are involved in saving and threatening face, and they're usually included in discussions of linguistic politeness. To really understand how these expressions work, we often have to dig deeper than the quantificational data. For example, a corpus search of BNC and COCA will tell us that are you sure as a phrase is very frequent in speech and in fiction, and fiction often has a large direct speech element, although it's not speech as such as a representation of speech in writing. So the statistics tell us that are you sure has some kind of particular function in spoken discourse. But what is it? To answer that question, we need to dig down to some examples. This example from COCA is fairly typical of how it's used in speech and in fiction. First, an offer is made. Then there's a polite refusal. And then the first speaker asks, are you sure, as a check and a re-offer. Next, the second speaker either confirms the refusal or accepts the re-offer. And then finally, the first speaker acknowledges or evaluates the acceptance or refusal. Now, this seems a very common sequence in English discourse, 
and we should note that it's a sequence that learners therefore might usefully internalise, have a check after a polite refusal of an offer. McCarthy and Carter call, are you sure, a commissive speech act. It allows someone to accept an offer or refuse it without a loss of face. So, discourse markers are small but significant little linguistic features that tell us a lot about the larger issues of how conversation is managed, and indeed about how personal relationships are managed through conversation. Questions that might arise from this session as a whole are, for example, do native speakers and non-native speakers use discourse markers in the same way? Is there an easy transfer from the first language to the second language? Or do discourse markers in a second language have to be explicitly taught? Are discourse markers used in different ways in different contexts? For example, in native speaker dialectal discourse or in different speech genres like business meetings or lectures or in English as a lingua franca situation. If discourse markers need to be taught explicitly in the English classroom, how should we actually go about doing this? That's plenty for us to think about. Again, thanks for listening.